Good morning, Nigeria and the rest of the world. We are going to be talking about the African Oyo Empire. We're going to be looking at the role of the Oyo Empire in world history, including the history of America. We're going to be touching on its role in slavery and becoming one of the richest slave traders in the world, as well as the new world that is being orchestrated in relation to the old Oyo Empire. And we're looking at this relationship with respect to its connection to Europe and also with respect to the Moors and the Jews and the Oyo Empire. There are both spiritual and biblical implications related to this empire. And so hang on for the ride. Let's rock and roll. So we're going to be approaching what is known as the Oyo Order. This is Dr. Tracy McCarthy, psychologist, attorney, and educator. We're going to be looking at this article from the Harvard Divinity School, and this is on the Oyo Empire. You will also see information related to the Oyo Kingdom. And the distinction between a kingdom and an empire is basically that an empire uh, pretty much is supposed to be a collective of kingdoms and so then you have an emperor uh, over these various kings you will also see information related to the Oyo kingdom if you start to do some research on this uh, that spans from the 1300s to the 1500s in terms of its inception you'll see similar dynamics related to the Oyo empire and so this particular article indicates that the Oyo Empire uh, started in the 1400s and ended around the 1830s. Uh, you will see that this goes along with the Portuguese expansion all over the world. Uh, you see that it coincides with the time of the Europeans landing in the Americas. You will also notice that the ending time is around the time that slavery and the slave trade was ending around the world. And you also had these battles for succession and the Oyo Empire was a part of this. And so the Oyo Empire is usually related to the Yoruba, uh, but you had the Oyo Empire having its reach throughout that west coast of Africa, incorporating Benin, Dahomey, and some of the other powers that we've talked about before. There's a very close connection between the Oyo Empire and the European colonial powers. This is largely because, of course, as with all of these other situations, the Oyo Empire is simply a manifestation of some of the European powers and some of the uh, leaders in Yoruba, some of the leaders in Dahomey, Benin, Ghana, uh, many of those leaders came straight from Europe. They look the way they look today because of some of the mixing with the indigenous people. Some of the people came, they were dark. Some of the people came, they were light. Ultimately, you have what you have right now. And you also have this uh, movement from the what would be considered the Middle East Asia, which was really Africa, uh, you have that movement coming from the east going west, if that's your orientation of the world. And the Oyo Empire is also uh, part of an instrumentality of the ancient Babylonian Assyrian Empire dynamic. And what you see here also is that the Oyo Empire was an important trade center and their main source of income was selling enslaved people to Europeans. This is important to keep in mind. When you hear that the Oyo Empire was selling captives to Europeans, even though they were situated in Africa, you are basically reading that dark Europeans were selling enslaved people to either dark or light Europeans. And that is the essence of what was going on. And so the Oyo Empire uh, was replete with Europeans uh, pretty much masquerading as something else. And so you essentially had the Moriscos and Moranos that exist in the United States. They were also on the west coast of Africa.
And here you have information that's provided by blackpast.org. Uh, this is from 2009, but it's a map of the Oyo Kingdom. And you can see the connections between Ghana and Dahomey and Alada and Nigeria and Benin uh, from this map. Uh, this is supposed to be around the time period of the 1700s. Uh, of course, you know from looking at maps from that time period that some of the maps look completely different. Uh, in contrast to this map that you see here. Uh, you do see some similarities, but in general, uh, the maps were all over the place. So you would see kingdoms being there and then kingdoms not being there. You see Negro land appearing and Negro land disappearing. And you see all of these reconfigurations based upon these conquest uh, and enslaving dynamics. And this is where you see this 1300 idea. So it was indicated that Oyo was a pre-colonial kingdom in present day Nigeria and it was founded in the 1300s. Again, you still have a dynamic of colonization going on at this time uh, because you had individuals coming out of Europe, going down the west coast of Africa and situating themselves there. And then you have a dynamic, the same dynamic that took place in the Americas. It's probably the same dynamic that took place in Australia, South Africa. It's the same dynamic, the same game plan. And so you had individuals establishing these kingdoms all over the place. And this was one of those kingdoms. Now, there were also some conquest dynamics that were going on. Uh, with respect to this particular kingdom. And so they were conquering neighboring kingdoms. And if you recall, there was a relationship between this kingdom and then the kingdom of Judah. Now, it's not always clear when you hear these names, these biblical names, uh, whether you are talking about the actual kingdom of Judah or whether you are talking about a Morisco Morano dynamic and whether you are talking about Babylonian Jews in that area, whether you are talking about Babylonian Moors in that area. The reason for this is, is that area was situated with groups of people who understood themselves as the ancient Babylonians. And so you also have these dynamics where the Moriscos and the Moranos have histories that appear to be heavily tinged with Babylonian history. And we will talk about that soon. And here you just see a reiteration of this dynamic of the Oyo Empire, Oyo Kingdom, being heavily involved in the transatlantic slave trade and also by extension in the trans-Saharan slave trade. And so this is basically how they made their money. This is how they became rich and powerful. And this also played a part in their expansion around the world. It also played a part in their participation in the colonization of the Americas. Uh, you see a heavy Oyo influence all throughout the Americas. Uh, sometimes you may not recognize that that's what it is, but that's what it is. It's a very heavy influence. You even see uh, indications of it within groups that identify as indigenous to America. So that's something for you to do a little research on, but it becomes obvious once you know some of the names associated with the Oyo Empire, and then you look at some of the names of the indigenous people. Uh, some of these names are actually not names of indigenous people. These are names that have been transplanted from the Oyo Kingdom uh, by way of the Moriscos and Moranos slash Moors and Jews uh, that came over that were part of the colonization process of the Americas. One of the critiques offered by the authors is that uh, there were these civil wars that took place. And of course, that's what the slave trade was tied to uh, purportedly, uh, these civil wars. And the battles 
with respect to the Oyo Empire. So inside of the Oyo Empire, there were civil wars going on. There was all of this strife related to this treasury that was owned by the Oyo Empire. And so they became extremely wealthy uh, based upon the slave trade and this trade with not only Europe, but with the Americas. And so you see this building up of all of this wealth. And to this day, they maintain a substantial amount of wealth. When you see who they actually are, you understand that they control vastly more wealth uh, than one might imagine. If you recall our earlier discussions about the kingdom of Judah, you might remember that at some point in time, the kingdom of Judah requested assistance for dealing with Dahomey. And so the Oyo provided some assistance for a period of time. And then that assistance was withdrawn at some point in time. And so you saw all of these internal strifes going on in and around this Oyo kingdom. And at one point, or Oyo Empire, at one point, Dahomey broke off uh, from the Oyo uh, collective. And then there was an aggressive move made by the Fulani uh, in relation to the Oyo. So there was this sort of breaking away from this empire, thereby reducing the size of the empire. It's unclear about what all of these different relationships were all about. Um, of course, the Oyo uh, was invested in empire building because of the history of the Oyo, the history of the Yoruba people. Uh, there was always this affinity for this uh, sort of Babylonian uh, ancestry, this Babylonian history, this Babylonian mission of globalization, of imperialism. And so there was a culture, regardless of time and regardless of migration, there was a culture of this idea of expansion and expanding around the world and ruling all over the world. Now you see that there was also this loss of resources and loss of power with respect to the transatlantic slave trade. And so it appears that there was sort of a European American snatching of some of this power. Um, however, it's always important to remember that all of these people are pretty much the same people. So when you see these people in control of things, they are all connected, they are related, they are cousins. And so it's not so much a real snatching away of power as it is a, a borrowing and leasing of power. Uh, for different periods of time. And the Oyo Empire, Oyo Kingdom is no exception. Uh, the Oyo Empire is uh, still a very powerful empire, even if it's not uh, recognized as such. And you can see that by its diaspora. You can see the resources that are held by its diaspora. You can see the uh, leadership roles that the diaspora might be playing in different countries outside of Nigeria. And so that lets you know that they are still wielding significant power throughout the world. You might notice that uh, different individuals throughout the world, even though they are situated in different places, they share phenotypes with people that are in distant lands. And even though you may see a difference in terms of skin color or hair texture, you might notice that the facial features are substantially similar. Uh, you might notice this specifically when you are talking about the Yoruba people. Uh, the Yoruba people, many of them have the epicanthic fold. Um, you see uh, some of the facial features in terms of the structures uh, that look very similar to what would be considered East Asians. And then you see a number of the words that are used and the constructs that are used that are also shared with uh, Asian cultures known as Oriental cultures. And so one of the things that you have here is the word Oyo uh, is detected as Japanese. And when it's translated into the English, Oyo means world. And so now you can see where this 
idea of global is coming from with respect to the Oyo. Now, when you translate the Oyo from the Japanese into Yoruba, another word comes up and it is spelled A-G-B-A-Y-E. And you can even see how there are letters or characters that look like uh, perhaps Japanese letters and characters uh, with respect to what is considered this Yoruba word. Okay, so now let's look at that word coming out of the Yoruba and going into the English. And what do we have? We find that Oyo, this construct of Oyo, translates into the English as global, universal, world, and universe. So in other words, the Oyo kingdom, the Oyo empire was the global kingdom, the global empire, the universal kingdom, the universal empire, the world kingdom, the world empire. They also understood this construct as universe, all encompassing. In other words, uh, this is synonymous with the construct of Catholic. And so Oyo and Catholic are synonymous. So this helps to make sense out of this connection between the Yoruba and the ancient Babylonian Empire. It also helps to make sense of the history of the Igbo in relation to what is considered uh, Western Asia. It also helps to make sense out of the dynamic between Europe and the West Coast of Africa and very specifically uh, the Yoruba area. Uh, that area is pretty much considered uh, central to a number of dynamics. And so what you have here is the Oyo Universal Empire, which is essentially the ancient Babylonian slash Assyrian Empire. And so what we are looking at, and you see that Solomon's not there, uh, there is an attachment to Solomon. This attachment could grow out of an actual relationship to Solomon, uh, specifically Jeroboam. Uh, it could also be an outgrowth of this attachment to Solomon and some of the dynamics associated with Solomon and power and uh, some of the spiritual issues uh, that were going on with respect to Solomon. And so there were many people that wanted the power of Solomon because of what Solomon uh, purportedly commanded. It's unclear about uh, the extent to which there is veracity with respect to uh, these dynamics with Solomon, but there is sufficient evidence to support this idea that uh, Solomon was uh, moving towards uh, having his own world order and also commanding all sorts of dynamics in the spiritual world. And so what you have here is the Oyo world order. Sometimes people get confused because they look at what they see on the surface. And so there's this narrative about Africa, a narrative about poverty, a narrative about being disempowered. And it depends on which Africans you are talking about. If you were talking about the indigenous people of Africa, then yes, you probably do have a situation where people are land rich and dirt poor which is the same dynamic that has been used to describe the indigenous people of the Americas, land rich and dirt poor. However, when it comes to this particular empire, not only is this empire still in existence, even if you don't recognize it as such, it has a far reach and it is highly resource and it is manifested in different places under the guise of other names and so you may not always recognize that you're dealing with the Oyo Empire or the ancient Babylonian or Assyrian Empire. Uh, there's a focus on 
you know, using those terms in relation to the United States. However, uh, given that the Oyo Empire, the Babylonian Empire, was instrumental uh, in the colonization of the Americas, it would stand to reason that you would have manifestations of the Babylonian Empire in the Americas, including the people uh, who uh, called themselves settling America, whether they were coming straight from Europe to do this, or they were coming from Africa to do this, or they were coming from uh, other parts of Asia in order to do this. So when you put together our prior research and our prior discussions with the current discussion, it's easier to see that Oyo world order umbrella under which many things are operating throughout the world. And it's also uh, easier to see the role of Nigeria in world rulership. And so you see that the Oyo kingdom is, the Oyo empire is uh, founded upon the ancient Babylonian system, the ancient Babylonian Assyrian empires. And you even see the word translating to the same thing, the same mission ultimately uh, as the ancient Babylonian mission or the ancient Assyrian mission. And so you see that it is understood as global and universal, understood as the world. And so you also see the reach of this world far beyond Nigeria. You see the reach of this history, even in the naming of states in the United States or the renaming of rivers and lakes and streams and the renaming of indigenous people to comport with uh, some of these cultural dynamics. And so you will see instances where you have groups of people, they had an original indigenous name, uh, but another name was given to them uh, and it was offered that this was a rendition of the original name. And it's just simply uh, basically an identity theft is what is going on. And so you have a replacement of those people. And again, the Moriscos and Moranos were integral to this entire uh, dynamic. And so just to wrap this up, one of the problems with having an accurate account of history uh, is because of the dynamic with the Moriscos and Moranos also. And so you had the Moriscos and Moranos with this sort of umbrella narrative of oppression and of inquisition and of persecution. And so you also had them hiding under the identity of Catholicism. And so you don't really know who you were dealing with um, in many instances. And you also had a situation where when people are operating under this persecution, oppression paradigm, sometimes there is the demand for uh, excusing whatever behavior the group might engage in simply because of this oppression uh, dynamic. And so you, you have that with the Moriscos and the Moranos, also known as the Moors and Jews. You have that with the Oyo, because sometimes they were operating under this umbrella of being enslaved. And it's really possible that when you had uh, individuals who found their way to the Americas as uh, Yoruba, as the Igbo, that they were not always enslaved. The likelihood is pretty high that they were not enslaved. I know that goes against the narrative, but if you dig a little deeper, uh, you will see that this makes sense with respect to uh, certain people groups. Um, and so you have these people groups that were moving all around as traders, um, but when it was convenient or when it is convenient, taking on this identity of oppressed uh, as uh, persecuted. And so therefore it obscures the history and you don't know exactly what you are dealing with. And you also have the um, dynamic of transplanting and then supplanting. So there was quite a bit of supplanting in association with the Moriscos, the Moranos, and the Oyo, the Portuguese, the Iberians. You have all of this supplanting going on all over the world. And so that makes it difficult to trace everything that has been going on. 
And if you check the various places around the world, you will see these calling cards deposited throughout the world. Uh, you have significant ethnic cleansing that has taken place throughout the world. And so you will see these calling cards. You will see these uh, deposits of culture, these deposits of artifacts, these deposits of people all over the world. And these calling cards were integral to this empire building. And now you have an empire, an active empire that is spanning the entire globe. Uh, sometimes it's going by different names. Uh, now it is considered uh, the Nouveau uh, World Operating System. So as we wrap up this discussion about the Oyo Empire, um, hopefully you have a better sense of some of the dynamics that have been going on in terms of world history and even in terms of current events. Uh, you can see very clearly that the Oyo Empire played a significant role in the transatlantic slave trade and that there was a significant relationship between the Oyo Empire and Europe and uh, the Eastern countries and also the Americas. And you still see the manifestations of that today. Uh, you also see that it's difficult to tease out uh, whether you are talking about light people or dark people when you're talking about the Oyo Kingdom because they were an integration, they are an integration of um, diverse people in terms of phenotypes, um, in terms of ancestry. And so you do see this heavy European presence in Nigeria. Uh, it is presenting, however, as an African presence, but it is in fact a heavily European presence and hence you have the back and forth between uh, certain groups of people in Africa and Europe and it looks like they are um, just obsessed with Europe but in fact their ancestry generally traces right back to Europe you see this with Jamaica going back and forth um, to Europe uh, you see this with a number of groups of people where they go back and forth to Europe and part of that is because of their connection to Europe Again, you see a similar dynamic with Brazil and Nigeria, where individuals go back and forth, and that's because of their roots and also because the relationship is not often the relationship that uh, we have been led to believe it is. And so the history is a little different um, and it is founded upon something other than uh, being enslaved. And so you see these connections that are related to trade and you see these connections that are related to uh, bloodlines. And so we are going to uh, carry on, um, if we can, with this conversation related to colonizers and confederacies and the taking of the new world. Remember, knowledge is power. Take care. See you soon.